It has stood the test of time. God's Book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Thanks for joining me today. This is It Is Written. I'm John Bradshaw. If you read very far at all into the Bible, you come across something very interesting, something which today, throughout Christianity, generates a fair amount of conversation. You'll read about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. What in the world were these two covenants, or are these two covenants? How can they be understood best today? And what role, if any, do they play in our lives? My very special guest is a man who has spent more than four decades in Christian ministry as a pastor, as a teacher, as a published author. We're going to discuss the covenants today. Pastor Skip McCarty, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, John. I'm grateful you've taken your time and we're going to use it as well as we can. The Old and the New Covenants. Let's talk about the New Covenant first. I'd like for you to define for us what biblically a covenant is and then what the New Covenant is. Great place to start. Covenant is something we don't talk much about. We don't use that language very much today. Anybody who has a mortgage is in a covenant. They're in a contractual relationship. If somebody has a credit card, they're in a covenant, a contractual relationship. We are involved in covenants even though we don't talk about covenants. Now when you come to the Bible, Old and New Covenants, those terms start showing up, particularly in the New Testament. The New Covenant is defined very clearly by God Himself. What's interesting is that in much of the literature written on the covenants and on the New Covenant specifically, the definitions are all over the map as to what the New Covenant is. And why is that? Can't we just go to the definition that we find in the Bible? Or are there good reasons for these varied viewpoints? The Bible is very clear as to what the New Covenant is, very clear. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and in Hebrews chapter 8, God says, this is the new covenant I will make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It's the only place where the new covenant is defined. Jeremiah 31, Hebrews chapter 8, and Hebrews chapter 8 quotes Jeremiah 31. Well, let's read that together. Okay. Hebrews chapter 8. And the definition itself begins in verse, verse 10. 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. There's the new covenant defined in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, because he's just quoting the Old Testament here. You said the New Covenant is defined in Hebrews and Jeremiah. Now, hold on a minute. Jeremiah is the Old Testament. What's the New Covenant doing being explained way back there in the book of Jeremiah? It wasn't even the book of Malachi, which is almost over in New Testament times, right. but way on back there, one of the major prophets. Please explain. Because God had made numerous covenants with His people before that, the last one, the last major one being the covenant at Sinai. And then, because they broke his covenant, as part of the covenant stipulations, they went into exile. They continued to break his covenants after all his appeals to them. So they go into exile. So they've been in exile now for 70 years. And they're wondering, well, what does that mean now? Are we still in a covenantal relationship with God? Or are we not in a covenant relationship with God anymore? And God says, I'm making a new covenant with you. And so he says, here is the covenant I'm making with you. And then he identifies that, as we've just read here, that could not be clearer, John. It couldn't be clearer than what you've just read. God says, here is the new covenant I'm making with you. And then he explicitly states what that covenant is. Four promises. Now, we just read it. Can you, can you break it down and put it in layman's terms for us? Four what promises, very clearly from God. Mm -hmm. I'm going to write my law in your heart. One. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Two. The time's going to come when you're not going to need to teach anybody about me anymore. Everybody's going to know me. Three. I'll forgive your sins. That's it. That's the new covenant. And when you look at it carefully, that's the gospel. The whole gospel is included there. 
I'll write my law in your hearts, that's sanctification. I'll be your God, you'll be my people, that's reconciliation. Everyone's going to know me, that's revelation. And that, in fact, that's the mission that was given to the church and given to Israel to teach people about God. And then finally, justification, I'll forgive your sins. The whole gospel is there in the new covenant. So the new covenant is found here in, in Hebrews chapter 8. It's found back in Jeremiah chapter 31. Right. What's the big deal? What's the big deal about the new covenant? Why did we need it? Why did God have to come along and say, all right, here it is. Here's the, the, the contractual agreement that we're going to have. Okay, this covenant here is not a contractual agreement in the same sense of like a mortgage or a, or a credit card. And like when you buy a car, you're negotiating. You want to get the least investment you have to make for the most benefit you get back in return. This is more like a will. And in fact, the Greeks had two different words for these kind of covenants. Syntheke was a negotiated covenant like a mortgage and a, and a car loan. But DFAK was a will, and that's the term that's used here. That's the term that's used consistently throughout for God's covenants with us. So the big deal is, God is saying, in order for you to be saved, you need what I can do for you. So this is a non-negotiable. This is an essential part of our salvation experience. Absolutely. So for, it's... for any human being who's ever lived, God must write his law in their hearts. God must forgive them. They must be reconciled to God again, and they must participate in his mission here on this earth. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Then we're, I think we're going to have to back off and, and get some explanation here because you've mentioned this two or three times, and God mentioned it right here. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. Now, I'm going to ask you for a one-word answer. Okay. God writing his laws in people's hearts. That's mm -hmm. essential, yes or no? Absolutely. Okay, then. Absolutely. What laws? The law that's given the most prominence in the Old Testament is the Ten Commandments. It's the only place in the Bible where God actually writes himself. And he spoke them audibly to the people. It's very clear from the Old Testament. So they stand out. And in fact, most theologians would acknowledge that the Ten Commandments were written on the heart of Adam and Eve at their creation. The principles of the Ten Commandments, the moral principles there, are timeless, they're eternal, they're cross-generational. And that's the law that God is writing here in their hearts. Because, it, in fact, just the very next chapter of Hebrews, in chapter 9 and verse 4, God talks about the temple furniture of the Old Testament, and he refers to the Ark of the Covenant that had the tables of the Covenant, which was the Ten Commandments, inside of it. He's linking here his law to the Ten Commandments. Now, we've got some people pretty excited because you've said in the New Covenant, God wants to put his Ten Commandment law in people's hearts. But many people believe and have been taught very genuinely that Ten Commandments is Old Covenant. New Covenant is something else. Let's pick that up in a moment. We'll be back with more straight ahead. In Matthew 4.4, the Word of God says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every Word is a one-minute Bible-based daily devotional presented by Pastor John Bradshaw and designed especially for busy people like you. Look for Every Word on selected networks or watch it online every day on our website, itiswritten.com. Receive a daily spiritual boost. Watch Every Word. You'll be glad you did. Here's a sample. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul wrote about a certain group of people who he said, received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Based on what Paul is saying, only those who love the truth will receive eternal life. He didn't say salvation is for those who know the truth only, but those who love the truth. I'm sure churches are crowded with people who know the truth, but it's only when Jesus touches your heart that that truth starts to make any real difference. While you study the Bible and do whatever else you do for spiritual growth, keep in mind, salvation isn't only about theory. You can be right and still be wrong. It's when you love the Savior, who you find in the midst of the truths of God's Word, that things really come alive. I'm John Bradshaw for It Is Written. Let's live today by every word. This is It Is Written. I'm John Bradshaw. My guest today is Skip McCarty. And today our discussion is centering on the question of the covenants, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And just a few moments ago, we discovered that the Bible plainly says that in the New Covenant, God would write His laws in people's hearts and minds.
Now, Skip, that alarms some people because some people equate Ten Commandments with the Old Covenant Mm -hmm. and the New Covenant as being without the Ten Commandments. Now, let's explain, if we can, why the Ten Commandments are a valid part of the New Covenant when so many people thought they went out of style when the Old Covenant went out of style. God himself said the first promise of the New Covenant is I will write my law on your heart. Now, Jeremiah was the first one to give us that. In Jeremiah's time, everyone thought of the law as primarily the Ten Commandments, what God had written with his own finger and spoke and what was inside of the Ark of the Covenant. The only part of the law that was actually inside the Ark of the Covenant was so treasured it was inside the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ten Commandments, in fact, are identified as the Covenant of Sinai. Now, there was more to it than that. In Deuteronomy 4 and verse 13, it identifies the Ten Commandments as the Covenant. So therefore, because people understand that the that Sinaitic covenant perhaps isn't in effect anymore, maybe the Ten Commandments are gone. Yeah. You can see this could be confusing in some minds. I can. Here's one fascinating thing about the study of the covenants in the Bible. Once you identify what the new covenant is, those four promises, mm-hmm. I'm going to write my law in your hearts, be your God, you'll be my people. Everyone's going to eventually know me. That's when Jesus comes again. That's when the new covenant is eschatological. It's looking forward to the future, ultimately, for its f- final fulfillment. I'll forgive your sins. These promises show up big time in the Sinai Covenant. In fact, one of the major results of this study is that these four New Covenant promises are saturated. The Old Testament saturated with them. They show up individually, but they show up in clusters in major places. Every covenant God made with his people in the Old Testament has these promises embedded in them. It has the gospel. It has the four promises in it. It's a gospel-bearing covenant just like the other covenants. Very interesting. The New Covenant talks about what God is going to do in a person's life. So it seems here that the New Covenant emphasizes surrender to God and allowing God to go ahead and be God in our lives. Yes. The New Covenant doesn't emphasize, okay, here's what you got to do in order to be saved. That's right. Did the Old Covenant emphasize that? Because I've heard it explained that under the Old Covenant, do this and you live, don't do this and you die. In other words, and, and a lot of people right now are going to agree with, with me, they've heard uh, it said, the old covenant, obey the, the commandments of God and be saved. New covenant, trust in Jesus and be saved. Perhaps we should talk about what the old covenant was. Just as the New Testament is trusting Jesus to be saved, the Old Testament was trusting Yahweh to be saved, trusting God to be saved. Was there ever a time when people were were saved by their works? Never. Impossible to be saved by works. From Adam's children until this very day. And the Bible never teaches that anyone was saved by works. So under the old covenant, it wasn't, well, if you obey these things, then you can be saved. It was salvation by grace through faith. How did that work in old covenant times? By grace through faith. Because many people today don't associate grace with the old covenant. It, it's like that was a covenant of works and the new covenant is a covenant of grace. Is, is, that is not true, huh? Where grace first shows up actually in, in the Old Testament is where Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. And just after the giving of the Ten Commandments, Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. And God says, I am a God who is gracious and compassionate. He actually reveals himself as a God of grace there reveals himself for the first time in the Bible as a forgiving God, was, was at Sinai. Sinai is a powerful grace covenant all the way through. It emphasizes love um, because the formula in the Sinai covenant was love God and keep his commandments. We can't love him unless he circumcises our hearts and God acknowledges that and says, I will do this for you. He says in Deuteronomy 30, I put my commandments, my word in your heart. And the psalmist said, your word is in my heart. It was always God's initiative all the way through, by grace through faith. Salvation's always been a matter of grace. Always. I would believe that, and I teach that, but I'm, I'm, I'm fascinating to hear you emphasize this, that all the way back, Old Covenant was not works, New Covenant grace. That's a misunderstanding. Oh, terribly so. Okay, explain terribly to so. me. Let, let, let's drill down on this just okay. a little bit. Explain how the Old Covenant was a covenant of grace. This is a revelation for lots of people. How was the Old Covenant a covenant of grace? I know you've touched on it, but let's zero in. Let's start back with Adam. When Adam fell, the first promise given was what? I will put enmity between you and so forth. Exactly. 
spoken to the serpent, but it was meant for Adam and Eve. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and, her seed and between and your seed. her seed and your seed. He, the seed of the woman, will crush the head of the serpent. The serpent will bruise the heel of the seed. Theologians refer to that as the proto evangelion which simply means the first pronouncement of the gospel. So the gospel shows up there in a little kernel, right there. It has to be that way, because once Adam fell, he was giving to his children sinful natures, and we could not pull ourselves up out of the pit. God had to take the initiative, and he announces that right to Adam. He actually announces it to the serpent, but it was for Adam's sake and for humanity's sake. Every covenant God gave his people from then on just amplified it, showed a little bit more of the gracious character of God and the terms of the covenant and so forth all the way through. So when you come to the New Testament and you have these statements like we're saved not by works but by grace through faith and so forth in, in Paul's writings, he's simply continuing to progressively reveal what has always been true all the way along. Every covenant God made with his people, John, incorporated the truths revealed in the previous covenants and added a little bit more information, added a little bit more of our understanding to it all the way through to the New Testament. When Jesus said, you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God, that didn't start when Jesus made those words. That was true for Abel. That was true for every single believer in the Old Testament period. They had to be born again, otherwise they were lost. How were you born again back then before Jesus had come along? Well, how could you be saved if you weren't born again? We're born with sinful natures. When Paul writes about the war between the flesh and the spirit in, in Romans chapter 8, that was going on inside of Abel, it was going on inside of Cain. Every single human being has had that spiritual war going on inside their hearts. How was that reconciled back then? Today, we recognize the spiritual war. We, we go to the cross, we, we go to God in heaven, we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we ask him to change our hearts. Jesus hadn't come back there when Cain, Abel, Methuselah, whoever it might have been. So how did that work practically? Well, right from the very start, they had sacrifices. Abel had a lamb sacrifice that was indicating that some innocent sufferer would die for, for his sins, that salvation would come through that one. That becomes clearer then as you go throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament. It just becomes clearer and clearer until finally they find out it's Jesus. He's the one. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So it was by putting their faith in the provision God had made symbolically through the sacrifices of the Old Testament that they were saved by faith through grace. Magnificent. We've got a lot to talk about, and I think this is going to take us a little while. Wait right there. We'll be back with, with more in just a moment. It Is Written is dedicated to sharing the gospel around the world. To discover more about It Is Written, I invite you to visit our website, itiswritten.com, and browse the dozens of pages that describe what we do and how we do it. Let's get to know each other better. Visit our website, itiswritten.com, today. This is It Is Written. Thanks for joining me today. My good fortune is to have with me Dr. Skip McCarty. We're discussing the covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. And Skip, a few moments ago, you mentioned a term, it's very interesting. You talked about progressive revelation. You said the covenant was really revealed in a kernel form back in Genesis 3 and verse 15. Mm -hmm. I will put enmity between you and the woman, her seed and your seed. And you said that as the, the Bible went on, mm -hmm. the covenant was revealed progressively. Ex yeah. Would you explain, yeah. please, this progressive revelation? Let me give you an illustration. Okay. When did God begin to forgive people? Now, there's a good question. It seems to me that God began to forgive people as soon as there was sin, as soon as there was something to forgive. It would have to, wouldn't it? As soon as his spirit was able to draw repentance out of their hearts, he would be a forgiving God. Sure. But it doesn't mention that he's a forgiving God until the second of the Ten Commandments. Before the second commandment, it, the Bible never says God loves anybody. It first shows up there. But then you read back and say, oh, well, that's been true from the beginning. Of course it was true from the beginning. And so when some of the New Testament language shows up, such as new birth and so forth that we talked about before, it's talking about things that have always been true, but God's just revealing a little bit more, giving us more language, giving us more, uh, more depth of understanding of what's always been happening. The new covenant didn't start over. It incorporated the truths that had been revealed previously. It incorporated God's law, his moral law that was eternal. He reiterates what had been true in the Old Testament too. He wants to put that on our hearts. Let's talk about the new covenant here in the time we have left. I want to ask you two questions. I think they're both fundamental and important. One is, how does participating in the new covenant actually look in my life? What's that going to do? That's one question. And the other question I believe we really need to address it is, are we promoting legalism when we say part of the new covenant 
is keeping the commandments of God? Have we just put people under a burden that they shouldn't be put under? So you can take those in any order you like. Okay. The new covenant lifts whatever burden may have may be there, completely lifts it off. Because in the new covenant, God isn't saying, you must do this. God is saying, I will do this for you. Do you think that's a problem that some people have who, who are afraid of legalism? They say, well, if once you start talking about the Ten Commandments, if I've got to do this, then you're putting me under a burden. When perhaps what we really need to do a better job is, of is teaching people that when it comes to obedience, this is really the work of God in our lives. It is the work of God in our lives. We can't make God be our God. God says, I will be your God. You'll be my people. We can't make any of these things happen. God says, I will put my law in your hearts. I will do this for you. The new covenant jot is God's embrace of a sinner who cannot dig himself out of the hole he's born into. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. The deeper the hole, the longer the rope. Mm. And Jesus himself is on the end of that rope to grab hold of you and bring you up out of that. This is new covenant. New Covenant is the brace of God. New Covenant is saying, everything you cannot do for yourself, which is everything in terms of salvation, I will do for you. And what's interesting about the Ten Commandments, the actual Hebrew is not commandments, it's words. That's why scholars talk about the ten words, because the, the Hebrew term davar is word. Translators come to that, they have to decide, oh, should we translate that word? Should we translate it command? Should we translate it promise? So instead of talking about the Ten Commandments, we, exactly. could, we could be talking about the Ten Promises. Exactly. Once conversion comes, it's Ten Promises. That's the whole point of the New Covenant is God saying, I'm going to write this on your heart. I promise you'll be this kind of person. It lifts the burden off of a believer. The way we become New Covenant is to throw ourselves wholly upon God and His grace. Because there are going to be many times in the best, in the most devout spiritual life on this earth, there's going to be times of discouragement, spiritual discouragement where we wonder, am I doing right? Am I on the right track? Am I really sincere in what I'm doing? God says, forget all that. Trust me. Just keep coming back to me. Spend time with my word. Open your heart to me in prayer. And I will do everything for you. I'll write my law in your hearts. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. I will forgive you. And I'm going to invite you into, into sharing who I am until the day when we're not going to need to do this anymore. That's what the New Covenant is. Interesting, isn't it, Hal? Uh, over time, the covenants have been explained as works and grace, or do versus believe. Total misunderstanding. Total misunderstanding. The Bible teaches that nowhere. How hopeful then, isn't it, that when someone says, what's the new covenant? And we go to Hebrews and read that passage. This is the covenant that I will make with the, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and... I add these words, I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Isn't this a matter of infinite possibilities opening up? What God wants to do in the heart and mind of someone who comes to him by faith. Precisely. God is saying everything that's necessary for your salvation and for you to have a fulfilled life on this planet, I'm going to do for you. I will even turn you into the type of person who loves to do the sorts of things I want you to do. Precisely. The Ten Commandments become Ten Promises, and we walk in the footsteps of Jesus. That is New Covenant. Skip McCarty, thank you. Thank you for taking the time today. I've been blessed, as have others. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for the opportunity. Today, I'd like to offer you a book that could change your life. It's called Simply Salvation. It deals beautifully with some of the most important questions that could ever be asked. How can you receive everlasting life? How can you know that your sins are forgiven? How can you experience the life that you were created to experience? I want you to have Simply Salvation. Call 800-253-3000. That's 800-253-3000. Supplies are limited, so you'll want to call right away. If you don't get through right away, please do try again. Or you could write to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91359. And we'll mail a copy to your address in North America. And I want to ask you something. If you're blessed by this television program, please pray for this ministry. And pray about supporting It Is Written financially. Help It Is Written to continue to reach the world with the message of hope in Jesus Christ. 
It is written as donor supported. Without you and people like you, we can't do what God has called us to do. To donate to It Is Written, you can call 800-253-3000 or give online by visiting our website, itiswritten.com. I've got just a couple of minutes with our guest for today, Skip McCarty. Skip, as we look over what we have talked about, the New Covenant experience, what's the impact of that in the life of someone who's, you know, your average business administrator or gardener or a bus driver? How does this help that person? First of all, John, I think it has to say to them, you're not just a gardener, you're not just a business executive, you're not just whatever, a waitress or whatever. You are a child of God. Before I was a minister, I did other odd jobs working my way through school, different kinds of work. But when I went to the factory, I didn't think of myself as just a factory worker. I thought of myself as a child of God. There was somebody that day in the factory that just by me doing good work or maybe my countenance or something I could say to them could make a difference in their life for the kingdom of God. That transforms life. That's all part of New Covenant. And so God wants to take everyday life and transform it. That's all part of New Covenant. That's God's commitment. I will do this for you here and now, as well as provide for you an eternal future. So the New Covenant versus the Old Covenant is not a series of or rules of engagement. No, my it, no. It's an experience we enter into with God. It is. And thank God Precisely. for that experience. Thank God Precisely. for that. I, I, I want everybody to have that experience, don't Amen. you? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Let's pray together and ask that we can have that experience that God wants us to have. Our Father in heaven, how thankful we are that you have made provision for us to be true Christians connected to you, rejoicing, healthy, happy, and holy, because you have said you would be our God. You have said you will accept us. You have said you will write your law in our minds and in our hearts. You will do everything needed for us to be saved and to be your children eternally. Lord, I thank you for that, and I pray that that experience would be ours. My friend, as we pray together and you are wanting that experience, would you lift up your heart to God now and say in your mind or say out loud, Lord, I want that experience where you are my God and I am your person. And as Skip has said, I can just trust in you and focus on you and let you be my God. Let whatever we have be all yours so that you can be all ours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining me today. I think, Skip, we're going to get together again and do this some more because we've got much more to talk about. Until then, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.